to book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 this morning. Very important message. I hope you all will get this today and practice this in your life. I want to show you something in the Bible. I want to maybe make you aware of something you might not know about this, but really a great power and authority you have. Anybody in here like power and authority? Uh, I, mean, I, think, I think if we were all honest, we all like a little bit of it. But you, I don't think many people realize the, some of the power and authority that we, that we do have as believers, as Christians. And I think it's important that we use this power that God has given us. Many are not using it, and I think there's good reason for that. But uh, there's a, not a good reason, but there's a, a reason many people use. But I want to show you something in here. In the Bible, David, let's go ahead and start reading in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother, their trespasses. So a long passage of scripture there, but I wanted to read all of it because every one of these things go together here from 15 all the way to the end of the chapter it's all about forgiveness, okay? And many times we'll take uh, different sections and kind of preach whole messages on them. But it's important that we see all of it because it is. It's all about, everything in here is about forgiveness. When it talks about, you know, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. It's specifically talking about forgiveness. When it's talking about where two or three are gathered in my name, you know, there am I in the midst. It's talking about all these things. It's talking about forgiveness, and so in verse 15 through 17, in the beginning, I believe Jesus is explaining the proper way of dealing with someone who's trespassed against you. See, we need to understand that sin, it should be dealt with. Sin needs to be dealt with. It is important. We see some pretty harsh stuff in this passage. We see the story of the man who owed this great debt. They were going to take him. They were going to sell him and his wife and children, take everything he had. You say, oh, that's kind of cruel. We shouldn't do something like that. But listen, this man owed a debt. When you owe something, you should pay it. If you sin, there should be payment for that sin. And thank God, you and I know, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Jesus Christ paid for our sins, didn't he? But do you all understand that not only, you know, Jesus did, he paid for all of our sins and that, because we owed him a sin debt, didn't we? Well, you know, that sin debt that we owed, it was owed to him. But do you understand here on earth, 
that when you sin against someone else, you owe that person. And right here, Jesus is telling us in these first few verses, if someone trespasses against you, this is the proper way to deal with it. Okay, the first thing you do, you go and you confront that person. You know what most Baptists do today when somebody sins against them? They go tell everybody else in the church. Do you know what so-and-so did to me? Do you know what they said about me? And they'll go and they'll tell everybody else about it. That's not how you deal with it when someone sins against you. You know what you do? You go talk to them. You, by yourself, you go talk to that person. Say, hey, listen, what you're saying is wrong or what you did was wrong. Hey, you owe me. You go talk to that person one-on-one. And then if they refuse to listen, if they're you know being ignorant or whatever, then you go and you get two or you get a couple of witnesses. That way every word can be established. And you know, you don't go get, we see in other passages of the Bible, you don't go get, just get your best friends. You know, you go get people that would, you know, everyone would agree would be impartial in that situation. People who are known for being just and being fair. And then you go and you confront that person and you've got, you have witnesses. Cause like, Hey, you know, if I go and I confront this person, it could turn ugly. I don't want there to be a fist fight. You know, I, you need two people. Maybe they said two people one, so one could hold you back and another could hold the other person back. You know, I, I don't know exactly why, but I think it was more just as a testimony for, you know, the things that were said, the words that were said. And if you get two people's testimony, and they're agreeing. We know from the Bible, then you can usually count on that testimony. And then finally, if they're still not going to listen, you bring it before the church, you bring it before the congregation. So if somebody in the church does you wrong and they clearly are in the wrong, you go deal with it one-on-one. You try to take care of it as quietly as you possibly can. But then if that doesn't work, you go, you get a couple witnesses. And then if that doesn't work, sometimes you have to bring things before the church. And there are some things that the Bible teaches. If it's going on in the church, that's not to be once named among you. And sometimes you have to deal with that publicly. And that's no fun when you have to do those things. But it is necessary sometimes that you have to publicly confront sin and deal with it. And you might even have to run somebody out of the church. Thankfully, we haven't had to do that. Usually, if somebody needs to go, the one-on-one conference confrontation usually sends most people packing and i i personally haven't had it get to the point where we've had to you know deal with something publicly in the church like that it's usually those first two things take care of it hopefully it'll get the person will get right but they don't always but at the same time this here this process that we just explained while not necessarily pleasant do you all understand that it is completely just It is 100% okay for you to handle things that way. You are not sinning when someone sins against you and you try to get things settled and get things made right. That is not a sin for you to do that. Jesus has just explained that to him. But then in verses 18 through 20, he tells us about some Really, I believe incredible authority we have. Because remember, sin has to be dealt with. That is why there is a hell. That is why there is a hell. And that is why Jesus died on the cross. Because sin has to be paid for. It can either be paid for by the blood of Jesus. I choose that method. Or I can spend eternity in hell. I definitely take Jesus' payment for my sin. But those are big deals because sin has to be dealt with. Our sin against God had to be dealt with. And sin against others needs to be dealt with. If somebody sins against you, listen, they owe you. But understand, though, that God has given us this great authority that I'm afraid that we don't always use. You know, we don't necessarily have to make people pay us back. We have the authority not only to not make them pay us back, I mean, but to literally wipe the slate clean. And to not hold them accountable for it. We have this ability to forgive people. And look, and so he's explaining that to us. And notice what he said there in verse 19. That if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done of them for my Father which is in heaven. Uh, I forgot to read verse 18. You know, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Do you all realize that, you know, one of these days we're going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account of some things. We're going to give an account for the things that are done in our body. There may be some scores that have to get settled in heaven because we don't take care of them here 
on this earth. Okay, not the sins against God, that's taken care of, but our sins against each other, we're going to have to get those things taken care of on Judgment Day. But do you all realize God has given us the authority here on this earth that we can take care of these things down here and heaven recognizes it? That if you sin against me, that and you're not willing to get things right, you owe me, and one of these days we're going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and you're going to answer for that. But do you understand that I have the authority to wipe the slate clean right now? That I can say, you know what? You don't owe me. I forgive you of that debt, and it's all clean. And when we get before, stand before God on ju the judgment seat of Christ, He's not going to bring that stuff up. He's not going to ask us about it. It's already been taken care of. It was done by us under all authority. We see in John chapter 20 and verses 22, and this is after Jesus had resurrected from the dead and He appears to His disciples. And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You all see the authority that he is giving them here? Now, sadly, places like the Catholic Church and, and even some other religions sometimes, they have taken this power and they've gone a little too far with it. Okay, This power that we have, it's limited. Okay, For one, we're only, we only have the authority to forgive sins against us, but not against others. Okay, For example, there may be some people in here, maybe you owe the credit card company. You owe the credit card company a whole lot of money. I don't have the right to forgive you of that debt, do I? Wouldn't that be nice if I could do that? Hey, I've just forgiven you all of all your debts. Go tell all your creditors, tough luck. All right? I don't have the authority to do that. I cannot do that okay? because uh, it's not me that you owe, it's them that you owe. And I don't even have the authority to forgive you of your sins that you've done against God. I don't have the authority to forgive you of the sins that you've done against other people. Okay? If you go, you know, if, if Brother Lonnie goes and he slaps Brother John in the face, you know, and Brother John's ready to haul off and hit him, I can't be like, hey, no, I forgive him for that. All right? How, how's that fair? Okay? I, I don't have the authority to do that. That's between, that's, that's between those two. Okay? And you do, you have, you have the, like the Catholic Church, you know, they've given this priest the ability to forgive sins, many sins that are against God. You know, they'll go to the confession, hey, you know, I cussed out my neighbor, whatever. All right, you know, I absolve you of that sin. Well, no, he doesn't go to the priest for that. He needs to go to his neighbor for that. He's the one that he sinned, he's the one that he sinned against. But at the same time, this is a great power that we have because sin has to be dealt with. And God has given us the power to just wipe the slate clean with sins that have been committed against us. This is a great thing. This is something that ought to excite us. And so we do. We have all that power and authority in the world to forgive sins against us, but not against others. And that now if someone sins against the congregation, all right, for, so in the church, if somebody does something that's a sin against everyone, I don't necessarily have the authority to say, all right, well, you went and man, you just, you hurt everyone in the church, which you did. It was very public. You embarrassed our church. You hurt a lot of people. I don't have the authority to say as pastor, you're absolved. Sometimes we might need to bring things before the church and say, hey, you know, so-and-so, they were on Facebook, you know, talking about how people from Liberty Baptist Church are just a bunch of knuckleheads and idiots and losers and a lot of people's feelings got hurt. But they're sorry for it. They, you know, they can't take it back. It's out there. They've hurt our reputation. They have hurt us personally. They have hurt us publicly, but they are asking for our forgiveness. They don't want to stand before God with that not being taken care of. And as a church, do we, are we going to forgive them? And as a church, you know, we do, we, have, we'll, we could publicly bring that up and hopefully we would decide to forgive that person and we couldn't do that. And even though damage has been done and even though we have been hurt, we can forgive them of that and that person one of these days will stand before God and it won't come up because we loosed it on earth and now it's been loosed in heaven. I don't know. I like to think, I, I like the thought of having the, the authority to affect things in heaven. 
I don't know, that makes me feel pretty good. I don't know, maybe I'm just power hungry. All right. But at the same time, it is, I think it's a good thing that we ought to take advantage of. And so, and there are, there's some things that people do when certain laws against individuals are broken. The victim, many times, they have the choice of whether or not they want to press charges. Okay. You know, it's against the law to go and strike someone. And I don't know all the laws on this. I could be wrong on some of this stuff. But I think if you came up to me and you punched me in the face, that, uh, I could press charges and you would get in trouble with the law. But I don't think you would unless I press charges. I have the, even though what you did broke a law, that law that you broke was against me. And I can say, you know what? I'm going to let this one go. I'm going to forgive you that. I, I have the authority, even in our community, to do something like that. Now, there's other laws. You know, you have like, you know, capital offenses or state laws, there's federal laws. That even if you did it, you know, if you did it to me, that I can't necessarily say you're forgiven. You know, that's considered a crime against the community, the state, whatever. I don't have the ability to do that. You're going to get charged with those things. But you know, even even in our nation, they recognize there are some laws that are against individuals. And while they're there to help and kind of enforce things, we have the authority to just say, you know what, I'm not I'm not going to do anything about that. And that's, and that's a good thing. And so, but there are, there's some things though that, you know, they will, they're going to deal with, you know, if you go and you murder someone, all right, none, nobody here has the ability to forgive you of that because of the fact, you know, you killed that person, you know, they're dead, they're gone. And that's why the Bible says for whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed as a society it would be wrong and it would be wicked for us to say, you know what, we're not going to do anything about it. You know, be like, oh, we should be forgiven. No, you can't be forgiving of something like that. That was not done to us. That was done to someone else. That has to be dealt with. And so we need to understand those things. And then verse 21 through 22, look what he says. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. I read one commentary. It said that many of the Jews back then, I haven't been able to find anything in the Bible that proves this. You know, they had a custom or a tradition that, you know, three times. After three times, then you had to quit. So it's like Peter, you know, they were, you know, he doubles it and then some. You know, he's trying to be extra spiritual. If I forgive him seven times, I'm clear, right? I don't have to forgive him after seven times, correct? And then Jesus said, Jesus said to them, I say not unto you, unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And you know what? I like how Jesus words this here. He didn't go, he, notice he doesn't correct him with the law. What does he do? He says, this is what I say unto you. Okay, let me give you a recommendation, Peter. Okay, and then, I don't know, this title for this message, it might not be completely appropriate. But you know, I, what I see here in this passage is not so much a command to forgive, but an extremely strong recommendation to forgive. And that's why it does a strong recommendation to forgive. Because, listen, if somebody sins against you seven times, all right, should that person not be punished? I mean, seven times? I mean, what parent, okay, every parent in here, you've let your kid get away with something before having it. They've done something, I'm going to let it slide this time. But after seven times... You're going to deal with it, and nobody would think you're a bad parent for that. And if somebody sins against you seven times, by now they certainly owe me, don't they? Yes, but Jesus is saying, you know, I say unto you not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And we know, too, that doesn't mean 490 times. Okay? I mean, and listen, I do. I think we've got a lot of spiritual accountants in the church. I sometimes think people walk around, they got a little notebook, and all right, this person didn't do this this week. And they're like, you know, they're keeping track. And listen, that's not what we ought to be doing is keeping track and, and keeping a tab. All right, they're up to 489 one more time, and I'm done forgiving that person. I mean, how would that, how would that work, do you think, in a marriage? If one of the spouses, and it would always be the wife, all right? It would always be the wife that did this. They're the ones that... And, and they don't have a book because women don't need a book. Women remember everything, don't they? But they, I, I do think they have a book that's in their head. And it's like whenever, you know, but it, imagine if every time you sin, you did something wrong, you made, you made a mistake. All of a sudden she pulls out that notebook and starts writing, you know, and she's keeping track, you know, 
Listen, we've been married for 16 years now, and you're you're in the 400s. You're in the four. You don't have too many opportunities. You know, what kind of marriage is that going to be? That's not going to be. That's not going to be a good marriage. But they do. You know, and I don't. I don't think anybody's wife in here has a notebook. All right. But every husband, you've gotten that before, and then all of a sudden they're bringing up something. You know, September third. You know, 1989. You said this, and you did that, and then you know, and we're supposed to try to have an argument. We know they've done equally as many bad things. But we don't have notes on it, all right? We don't have anything, we don't have any documentation. We can't remember dates. We don't remember details like women do. And so we lose those arguments every time, don't we? All right? And so, you know, nobody would do this except for the wives. But at the same time, if they, you know, if they actually did, that would be bad, wouldn't it? And do you think Jesus is telling people, start keeping track? And when they get to 490, throw them under the bus at that time? That obviously is not what he's saying. You know, he's just telling them, listen, I'm telling you, just keep on forgiving them. Just keep it up. I strongly recommend that you continue to forgive that person. What Peter is thinking he should do, I think it would be you know, just and lawful. If somebody sins against you seven times, I think it's time to deal with it. And I think it was fine according to the law. But Jesus, he wanted Peter to just basically say, you know what, Peter, just don't keep track. Don't keep track of that stuff. And it would, it would don't keep lists. Don't keep a list of people who owe you in this church. Don't be, don't be sitting around making lists. I'm going to mark you down in my book. All right? you know, don't, don't do things like that. That's just going to, that's going to give you a bad attitude, and you're going to be walking around. You know, who's going to offend me this week? You know, who do I get to put in my book? All right? you know, that, that, that's, just, that's wicked. That's a terrible attitude. That shows a very unforgiving spirit. And yet, in forgiving someone 70 times 7, I don't believe it's necessarily a command. Because if it were a direct command, then yeah, we could keep track. And then at, when they get to 491, you know, we're done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. But this is a strong recommendation for our benefit to just basically don't keep track. Don't worry about it. You know what? If they come and they ask you for forgiveness, just give it to them. Just give it. Be liberal in your giving of forgiveness. And so some things to remember about forgiveness too we need to understand is for you to forgive someone... They do have to ask. Okay? Now, we know Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. We know that Jesus is forgiving, but do people who don't ask for forgiveness get, get forgiveness? No, listen, it's there. It's ready for them, but they don't get it. They don't get the benefits of it until they ask for forgiveness. And listen, if someone sins against you, yes, have forgiveness ready to go. I mean, you be ready to forgive. The moment that that person comes to you and says, hey, I want your forgiveness, you shouldn't even have to think about it. You should be all ready to go. That forgiveness ought to be there in your heart. But you understand, you know, people can't get forgiveness unless they ask for it. And it is. It's hard when someone does something against you and they don't think they did anything wrong. You know, you want to let it go. You want to be able to forgive, but they haven't asked for it. So you can't give them that forgiveness. Oh, we should give it anyway. Well, Jesus isn't going to give it to those who don't ask. Those who don't call on the Lord for salvation are not going to get it. And so the truth is we can't give it to people who don't ask for it. And so we need to understand that. And, and also, this is another important thing to remember about forgiveness. No one is entitled to, for, entitled to forgiveness. Okay, See, because if that were true, if forgiveness was an entitlement, then wouldn't that mean that we can earn forgiveness? But listen, folks, we can't earn forgiveness, can we? We cannot earn forgiveness. It's something that we have to ask for and that God gives us out of grace and mercy. And so, yeah, and I hate when people do that too. You know, they'll come, they'll do something to you. I'm sorry. And, you know, it, it, and then they act like you're entitled to forgive them. And I know I owe you this. But you know what? You should be forgiving. You know, you're supposed to be a Christian. You should just let this go. You should turn the other cheek. Have you ever had a person tell you that, especially a lost person? Oh, I thought you were a Christian. Christian's supposed to turn the other cheek. Christian's supposed to do this. You know, listen, you're not entitled to that stuff. Listen, if you smite me on the cheek, you know, hey, eye for eye, tooth for a tooth is still in the Bible. But... I shouldn't do it though. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it again. I shouldn't do it though. 
Okay, God does not want me to do that. And there's a good reason for that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But understand, it's still just. It is still just. And, but, and so, you know, forgiveness, it's not, it's not an entitlement. Don't ever go to someone and demand forgiveness. No, you ask for forgiveness. And you hope that they are gracious and merciful and will give you that forgiveness. And listen, and those of you, if you're on the end where you're needed forgiveness, you know, don't make people crawl and grovel and cry and all that stuff. You know, don't be that way. You could do that and it would be just in some cases. But I strongly recommend that you don't do that. And we'll see why here in a little bit too. But forgiveness, it is something that God, you know, that God expects from us. Okay? It's not necessarily, you could say, you know, I do believe it was kind of a command. I'll show you why that in a little bit. But we see here in this passage that it is, it's something that God expects from us. But it's like my children, okay? But it's not necessarily a legal requirement. Okay? Like my children, when they grow up and they leave my house, they are no longer under my authority anymore, are they? But that doesn't change the fact I have certain expectations for my kids. As long as my, my kids are living under my roof, they're not going to be allowed to drink. Okay? After they leave my house, they're not under my law anymore, are they? But, but at the same time, because they've been taught right, because I have you know, trained them right, I expect them to continue on in that. You know, the Bible says, um, train up a child in the way he, should go, the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have every reason as, ex, as uh, parents to expect our children to do think, certain things when they are no longer under our authority. Because you know, we raised them right. We taught them right. But legally, as parents... Do we force them? Can we force these things upon them? No, we cannot. We can only expect and hope for the best. And I do believe that God expects us to be forgiving because of the fact, did he not set the greatest example in the world? Do we not as believers admit that we were saved from our sins? We were given forgiveness that we did not deserve, that God gave us grace and mercy. We sing amazing grace all the time. We sing songs like I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. We know all those verses in the Bible about grace and mercy. And so isn't it understandable that God would expect us to be the same way since we know about it? And if you train your children a certain way, once they're out from under your authority, yes, legally they're not obligated, but boy, do you not expect it. And you will be disappointed if they do not follow those things. And I believe God is extremely disappointed when we are not forgiving. And when we're not merciful to other people. Now, God, on the other hand, I do believe that God is obligated to forgive. So well, why is that? Well, there's only one reason that God is obligated to forgive, and it's because he said he would. And so anyone who asks God for forgiveness, they're going to get it. You know why? Because God said he would. Amen. Okay, It wasn't the law that made God obligated. It's not necessarily his holiness that made him obligated to forgive us. But what made him obligated to forgive us was the fact that he said he would. It was him that said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It was him that said that. It was him that said, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, God obligated himself to forgive us of our sins. And so thank God for that. If we ask, he will forgive. He could have just let us all go to hell and he still would have been holy and just. He could have done that. If someone sins against you, you can hold them accountable for that sin. You can make them pay whatever it is they owe you. You can make them get it right and you'll still be just. But should you do that? Is that what God expects from us? I don't believe it is because he set an example for us on being forgiving and on mercy and he wants it from us. And so when we read verses 23 through 25, that's where he gives, the, he gives the parable of that servant, the one who owed this great debt. And he was forgiven that great debt. That man was able to forgive him of that debt because it was him that he owed. And he did. All right, you know what? I have the power to take you and your family and to sell you. And I'm not going to do it just because you required it of me. You asked me. That's it. When, that's what God did for us. God forgave us because we asked him, not because he had to, not because he was obligated. 
I do. I hate that attitude of you owe me forgiveness. That is a horrible attitude to have. That is not a biblical attitude to have. Don't ever throw a verse about forgiveness in someone's face that you're trying to get forgiveness from. You need to understand that you don't deserve it, yet you, you can't earn it. They can only give it if they're willing to be gracious and merciful. And you can't demand that of them. That is not right for you to do that. Only God could do that because God did it for us. And we see in the story that that same man who was forgiven the great debt went and is choking somebody trying to get a small debt from them. And that ruler, man, he is upset. What in the world? I forgave you this great debt and you're going to go and attack somebody because they owe you a small debt? What's going on? He expected more from him. After the debt he had been forgiven, he expected that man to go on and be a forgiving person too. And God has forgiven us a great debt, and therefore he has expectations for us. And the judgment this man received, you know, we see it talks about delivering him to the tormentors. And a lot of times people look at that and, you know, say that symbolic of the man going to hell. I don't believe that that's what it is because a person who gets saved and forgiven of their sins, we're going to heaven no matter what. Even if we are not forgiving after we get saved, I do not believe this means we lose our salvation. Okay. But earthly judgment can still come on believers. Look at what it says in first Peter chapter four and verse 14. It says, if ye be reproached, for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you, he's talking to believers here, suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know, there's, there's two ways we can suffer. Sometimes we suffer as a believer. If we do that, we get rewarded greatly in heaven. If we suffer as an evildoer, we just suffer. No rewards for that. No promise of deliverance from that. If I go as a believer and I murder someone, and then the state comes and says, all right, we're going to put you to death. We're going to execute you. I, I don't get to go to God and say, Lord, will you forgive me? Well, yeah, I'll forgive you for your sins against me. But listen, you killed somebody. That was a great... you. We're going to have to die for that sin. I believe that I would, I would be executed. If I were executed, I would still go to heaven, but I still got executed, didn't I? I still got put to death. You know why? I suffered for evil doing. And a person who is a believer, they still will suffer when they sin. And so we see here in that story, that man, he's delivered to the tormentors. You know why? It's just, that's talking about earthly punishment for sin. This man was not forgiving like he should have been. And he suffered as a result of it. Why? Because he owed a great debt. And then look at Romans chapter, thir uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 through 5. Romans chapter 13. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Okay? When we hear the word damnation, we usually think about going to hell, but there's spiritual damnation, which is going to hell, and there's physical damnation, which is just dying physically for your sin. Everyone who's ever been executed received physical damnation. You could even say, too, that those who were martyred for their faith, those who died for preaching the gospel, they received physical damnation, but did they get spiritual damnation? Absolutely not. Those people went in heaven, and they're getting a special crown for what they went through. But it is possible for a believer to receive physical damnation. It's possible for us to suffer physically for our sins. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister to God of thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. He's talking to believers here. He's like, hey, if you're doing evil, you better be afraid. Oh, now listen, I'm going to go rob a bank and I'm just going to be singing nothing but the blood the whole time and talking about I've been cleansed from my sins and I'm robbing this bank, but I've got nothing to fear because God's forgiven me. Well, yeah, maybe he did, but you know what? That bank's probably not going to forgive you. 
You know, the law is not going to forgive you. That minister of God, that uh, whether it be a police officer or whatever that comes after you and tases you or shoots you and handcuffs you, you ought to be scared of that guy. You ought to be scared of him because he is a terror to the evildoers. And if you are doing evil, you ought to be afraid because you're going to pay. And that's what we see at the end of this passage when he's delivered to the tormentors. Listen, folks, if, even though you're saved, if you do evil, you're going to suffer on this earth. Not just by the hand of man. And we don't have time to go into all the scriptures about the chastening hand of God. We're God's children. And you know, people do. They take the fact that we teach eternal security, that once saved, always saved. That you, know, you can be saved and go sin and still go to heaven. It's like the people are teaching, you, uh, you believe in license to sin. Well, listen, if you think execution is licensed to sin, then go for it. If you think the chastening hand of God is licensed to sin, go for it. Those things aren't pleasant. I don't want those things. There are plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about us fearing God even after we're saved. Why? Because he has the ability and the authority to bring some serious wrath upon us and some serious punishment and judgment. And so we've got to, we, we should... Fear those things. And the judgment that man received, I don't believe it's a representation of hell, but earthly judgment that can still come on us as unbelievers. You go out there and you just start going against what the Bible says. You go on out there and you start doing evil to other people. And I promise you will suffer here on earth even though you are a believer. And so as Christians, you know, we are still, we are, we're still open for earthly judgment from man and from God. And that judgment from God, it's called chastening. And it can be severe. And so God, He's given us this great power and authority as believers. And how we use that power, that determines how God deals with us. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. See, this is where this, you say, you know, what's the benefit? You know, what's my benefit of having the power to forgive sins? I would rather have the power to hold it against them. Well, you do have that power to hold it against them too. But you're going to see, you don't want to use that power. I would rather use my power to forgive people. You know why? Because in Mark, or Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, let me tell you something. I, would, I want my debtors to be very forgiving. Or, I, not, or those who owe me. Or those who I owe, I'm sorry. My creditors. Those who I owe, I would love it if they were very forgiving. I would love it if those I, you know, people I owe bills to, if they said, you know what, we don't feel like charging you for this. Thank you. That doesn't happen very often, though, does it? That did happen here one time. The guy who striped our parking lot, he sent us a bill. We paid the bill. And then he sent us a full refund. And it was just a blessing. You know, thank the Lord for that. I, I really appreciated that. And we kind of need it done again. And guess who I'm going to call? And you know what? And I'm not going to expect him to give it free again, but I will gladly pay him this next time, especially after the fact he did it for free the last time. And so, you know, but I do, I want, I want that. I want God to be extremely forgiving with me. I mean, I want God to just not care when I do something wrong. You know, when I, when I owe him, when I sin and I deserve punishment, I want him to give me a blessing instead. That's what I want. And the Bible says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, if I'm making everybody pay up, what's God going to do to me? He's going to make me pay up. And that's why Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And why wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out of the moat out of thy brother's eye. Listen, if God's going to judge me the way I judge others, I kind of would like for God to just be real easy on me. I would like for God to just let everything go and give me blessings instead. Well, listen, God is the only one who's obligated to forgive because God said that he would. And God also said that he will forgive us and he will judge us as we judge other people. So you know what? I recommend those who owe you, you be a blessing to them. Those who have done you wrong, that you just forget it. That if you are one of those people and you've got a book and you're keeping track, I recommend you tear that book up 
and you burn that book up and say, forget it. You know, I'm not going to hold things against people. Those who do me wrong, I'm going to do good to them. And God will see that. And God judges us the way we judge other people. He said he would do that. Do you all realize the opportunity we have right here? Do you realize this power that God has given us this golden opportunity here. I hate to sound like a crooked salesman right now, but folks, this is golden right here. You, because we do, we get sinned against all the time. All of, and we sin against God all the time. And many of us, many times we suffer because we deserve to suffer. And I don't like suffering. And my way of affecting things and how God deals with me is based solely on how I am with other people. And so listen, folks, if somebody owes you, if they do you wrong, yeah, you can hold it against them and still be just and still be lawful. But I say unto you, let's just forgive. Let's not, let's not worry about it. If, if, it's, if it's done to you, you can do that. You can wipe the slate clean. And not only should you wipe them, as, if, if they owe you, not only should you wipe the slate clean, I think it would be a good idea to, you know what, actually credit their balance. What do you mean? You know what, go ahead and give them a blessing too. You don't think God's not going to see that and do the same thing with you? Do we believe the Bible, folks? That's what the Bible says. Why would we not pass up that opportunity? A lot of people sitting around bitter and angry, always talking about all the things that were done against them. And these are miserable people. Why is that? You know why? Because God is dealing with them in their life the way they're dealing with other people. They can't forgive anybody. So they're not getting any forgiveness in their life. They're not blessing anybody. So they're not getting any blessings in their life. And yet there's a lot of people out there, they're just happy and enjoying life. And yeah, they've been done wrong. But they have, they've learned to forgive. They've learned to be a blessing to others. And so, folks, I strongly recommend you to be forgiving people. If you've got somebody right now that, you know, that owes you, once again, if, if, they, if they don't ask, there's not much we can do, but you can still have it ready to go. You could still be a blessing to that person. You, you can. You could still do that. You know, you could try to help make it easier for them to ask you, for that forgiveness. There's things we can do to help to help that along and to help that out. And so I do, I strongly recommend you do that. Be forgiving. So with that, let's all stand together.